Andrew Weissman, let me let me go back and 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 just let's spend some time in the time capsule in, in terms of things that have been established. This is Trump and Cohen in their own voices. This is a recording. And, and again, it gets to the structuring and Trump's role in designing the financial structures for paying hush money to women with whom he had affairs. Hello to the barking dog. Let me play this for you, Andrew. I need to open up a company for the transfer of all of that info regarding our friend David, you know, so that I'm going to do that right away. I've actually come up and, I've spoken, me. and I've spoken to Alan Weisselberg about how to set the whole thing up uh, with so what are we gonna funding. That, uh, yes. Um, and it's all the yeah, stuff, all the stuff, because, you know, you never know where that company, you never know where he's going to be. Gets it by Correct. So I'm, I'm all over that. And I spoke to Alan about it when it comes time for the financing, which will be. Listen, what financing? We'll have to pay you. So pay the no, 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 no. I've watched enough mob movies to know that innocent people don't utter this sentence. "Quote: Pay with cash." Andrew, <laughs> what are we, what are we entering into if, if this goes to trial? As Trump has said, he plans for it to be the path he takes. So, you know, this is one where um, obviously Michael Cohen is a difficult witness. Um, he is. He is really not your ideal government witness for a whole host of reasons, including the fact that he's still talking, um, and that <laughs> that differentiates him from from you know anybody who I've ever dealt with as a cooperating witness. But that being said, these are really experienced um, state prosecutors. They've you know they've been in this territory. This is their bread and butter doing these kinds of cases, and this particular case not that complicated. Um, and so this case is going to be, I think, as Suzanne sort of mentioned, is, is I think, really going to be made on documents. And that tape recording is one where there are a number of ways that can be used, not just for the fact that you have Donald Trump himself on tape saying, you know, obviously, who sits there and says paying cash? If it was legit, you'd be like, I'm going to wire the money or I'm going to send him a check. I mean, that's, it just makes no sense. But the fact that... Michael Cohen was taping it, shows that you, Michael Cohen is not going to tape record it as somebody who's going to say, what are you talking about? I don't know anything about this. Um, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, and that's not what you hear. What you hear is, wait a second, pay in cash. I mean, so the very fact of the tape recording is something that the DA's office knows to use very well to corroborate uh, uh, to our car rate, Michael Cohen. And then just one small caveat, which is, you know, Donald Trump has not had his day in court in a criminal case. So it is true that there has been no refutation by Donald Trump. We have a lot of adjectives. We have a lot of adverbs. We have a lot of epithets about um, the DA and the case. But that's not an argument. That is not a fact. That is not mm. a, any legal argument that's been made, but he will be have a, a place where he can do that. But so far, I totally agree with you. We have just a lot of adjectives masquerading as some kind of factual or legal refutation, and we haven't heard anything to refute this. Um, and I do think one of the things the media gets wrong is to sort of cover adjectives and adverbs as if it's anything. It's, it's, it's literally nothing more than the paper it's printed on. So we will have a hard ban on adverbs around here in honor of you, Andrew Weissman. <laughs> I, I want to read something. <laughs> I, I want to. I don't want to start with this, but we are going to spend some time today just exploring um, the the sort of political response to um, the evidence amassed by by Alvin Bragg. We've talked a lot, you and I, again on and off TV, about his reluctance to pick up and pursue this case with vigor. Um, he, has, he has done just that. Um, but I, I do want to talk about the investigators who came before Alvin Bragg, because I think Republicans don't want anyone to know this. But the Southern District of New York found this, quote, during the campaign, Michael Cohen played a central role in two similar schemes to purchase the rights to stories, each from women who claimed to have had an affair with individual one, Donald Trump so as to suppress the stories and thereby prevent them from influencing the election. With respect to both payments, Michael Cohen acted with the intent to influence the 2016 presidential election. Cohen coordinated his actions with one or more members of the campaign 
including through meetings and phone calls about the fact, nature, and timing of the payments. In particular, and as Michael Cohen himself has now admitted, with respect to both payments, he acted in coordination with and at the direction of individual one, Donald J. Trump. My, my question, Andrew, is whether we can assume that, that this line, so the Southern District of New York investigated and found this. Michael Cor Cohen coordinated his actions with one or more members of the campaign, including through meetings and phone calls, about the fact, nature, and timing of the payments. These are the people, some of them, who, who were in before Alvin Bragg's grand jury. They include Hope Hicks. They include Kellyanne Conway. They include David Pecker and others. Are we to assume that Alvin Bragg matched the investigative approach of SDNY, albeit while pursuing evidence to support crimes other than federal campaign finance violations? Absolutely. I would think that, that the federal case that you're outlining is a subset of the work that was done by the DA's office. Because remember, we know from Jeff Berman's book that the attorney general, Attorney General Barr, put a kibosh on pursuing that case after Michael Cohen pleaded guilty. And to your point, Michael Cohen admitted this was a crime. His defense lawyer viewed this as a crime. The prosecutors in the Southern District viewed this as a crime. The federal judge overseeing the case accepted the plea as a crime, didn't say this is not a crime. And importantly, the general counsel of the Federal Election Committee viewed this as a crime. So the claim now by Donald Trump that he didn't think this was a crime is, is you know, he's going to have a court of law where he can make that argument um, and we'll see how that fares. But there is a record now, which, as you say, Nicole, so far is undisputed. Um, there's, there's no uh, factual or legal basis that's been set out as to why this is not a crime. Is there anything that stops Merrick Garland from, once these crimes have been charged in state court, um, looking at this case, or is there any obligation to answer why, after Bill Barr was long gone, nothing was ever done with facts and evidence that are strong enough for Bragg to have brought his own case? So on the first question, there is um, something called the Pettit policy, where um, what, it, what that is intended to do is to not have duplicative federal and state charges. It's a DOJ policy where before you would have so-called duplicative charges, you would examine whether it really makes sense and is there some separate federal interest that needs to be vindicated. Here, where you do have a state charge going forward, you could imagine the feds not doing it. I think more importantly is I do think that it is important to know um, why the current attorney general did not go forward. Um, like Suzanne, I have the same issue with respect to why there are no tax charges, federal tax charges. As you recall, in the Trump organization um, charges, I've, I have never seen a state case in an indictment, and then Letitia James in her civil complaint, they screamed out over and over again that these are federal crimes, not just state crimes. Um, when um, Alan Weisselberg pleaded guilty, he's, his guilty plea, his allocution was that these were state and federal tax crimes. To Suzanne's point, this is really her expertise. So I've never seen the state so loudly call out that this warrants federal prosecution. And we have seen nothing at the federal level um, I do think that, you know, as we've talked about, um, Jack Smith has a lot on his plate, um, and this doesn't directly go within his remit, but it would be nice to know what in God's green earth were they doing and what, if anything, are they doing? Um, because it really does seem like this is one where they dropped the ball.